What if we told you that China just solved an energy crisis that American scientists have been calling physically impossible for over half a century? What if, while the United States was busy patting itself on the back for being the world's energy superpower, Chinese engineers were quietly building something so revolutionary, so audacious, that it could render every nuclear power plant in the West obsolete within a decade? This isn't about basic solar panels. America already made it one of the cheapest, most reliable sources of energy in almost all of its states. And we're not talking about wind turbines either. This is something far more powerful and far more game-changing than anything the world has seen since the Manhattan Project of World War II. The Genesis But this story dates back even further. Between 1958 and 2006, China completed the construction of the Qinghai Tibet Railway or Qingzong Railway. Today, with more than 600 meters of track being more than 13,000 feet above sea level, it's the highest railway line in the world. Passenger trains now run from Beijing, Chengdu, Chongqing, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Xining, and Lanzhou, and can carry between 800 and 1,000 passengers during peak season. Of course, building such an edifice was no easy task, and there were bottlenecks that engineers had to work around. For starters, about half of the second section was built on barely permanent permafrost. In the summer, the uppermost layer thaws and the ground becomes muddy. The heat from the trains passing above can melt the permafrost, even with a small change in temperature. The permafrost's weakness is the main issue. For areas of permafrost that aren't very fragile, an embankment of large rocks could do. However, in the most fragile areas, the railed must be elevated like a bridge. The engineers dealt with this problem in the areas of weakest permafrost by building elevated tracks with pile-driven foundations sunk deep into the ground. Just like the Trans-Alaska Pipeline system, portions of the track are also passively cooled with ammonia-based heat exchangers. This sounds very mind-blowing, but trust us when we say that this newest invention dwarfs anything China's made before. Energy for the Future very recently, deep in the barren expanse of China's Gobi Desert, a team of 750 scientists achieved what America's top nuclear physicists declared was a fantasy, a pipe dream that defied the laws of physics and economics. They fired up the world's first commercially viable thorium molten salt reactor, and after a couple of test runs, it now works perfectly. No meltdowns, no radiation leaks, no catastrophic failures, just clean, limitless energy that could power entire cities for pennies on the dollar. Even better, this reactor runs using a fuel so abundant that China has enough of it buried in their soil to power the entire planet for the next thousand years. When the news broke, the silence from Washington was deafening. The U.S. Department of Energy, an institution that has billions on failed nuclear projects over the past two decades, quietly issued a one-paragraph statement acknowledging China's achievement. MIT professors who'd publicly mocked China's thorium ambitions suddenly started retracting their papers. Energy consultants who'd built entire careers insisting thorium reactors were 50 years away went radio silent on social media. And President Donald Trump? Well, his words from years earlier suddenly felt prophetic. I love China. People say, oh, you don't like China. No. I love them, but their leaders are much smarter than our leaders, and we can't sustain ourselves. China, you go there now? Roads, bridges, schools, you never saw anything like it. They have bridges that make the George Washington Bridge look like small potatoes. Because here's the uncomfortable truth that no Western politician wants to admit. China didn't just build a better nuclear reactor, they've built a technology that makes America's entire energy strategy look like a relic from the Stone Age. While the United States clings desperately to aging uranium reactors that produce mountains of radioactive waste while also posing the constant risk of Chernobyl-style disasters, China has leapfrogged straight into the future. But away from politics, why does this matter for all of us? The energy crisis we were hoping way, well, it's because contrary to what most people would like to believe, the global energy crisis isn't coming. It's already here. The signs have been there for quite a while now. During the winter of 2022, when Russian gas supplies were cut off, Europe froze. Head of the International Energy Agency is warning European countries to prepare contingencies in the event Russia completely shuts off the gas supply to the continent during winter. 
Things aren't exactly better in America either, as California's power grid keeps on failing every summer when air conditioners should run at full blast. Things are even worse in developing nations across Africa and Asia. Gigatons of carbon dioxide are being pumped into an already suffocating atmosphere just so coal can be burned to keep the lights on. And while we stumble in this quagmire, the world's population is expected to hit 10 billion by 2050. Each of those 10 billion people will need electricity to run their lives. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like our traditional energy sources can keep up. Fossil fuels are cooking our planet in real time. The vast amounts of land that solar and wind energy need to function aren't a wise decision when you consider how intermittent they are. Since they disrupt and even destroy entire ecosystems by blocking the annual inflow of sediments and nutrients, hydroelectric dams are too risky for us to rely on them. And uranium-based nuclear power? Well, after what happened in Fukushima in 2011, when a tsunami triggered a meltdown that irradiated hundreds of square miles of Japanese coastline, let's just say public opinion has turned against nuclear energy altogether. Humanity needs something different, a miracle almost. We need an energy source that's clean, safe, abundant, and scalable. And that's where thorium comes in. But then the story gets infuriating, especially if you're an American taxpayer. The United States actually invented thorium reactor technology, or at least we're one of its main pioneers. In the 1960s, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee built and operated the world's first molten salt reactor using thorium fuel. For about four years, the facility ran flawlessly, and scientists called it the future of clean energy. But then 1973 came, and the U.S. government suddenly shut it down. The reason? They couldn't make nuclear weapons from thorium. The uranium reactors that America was building could produce plutonium, the key ingredient for atomic bombs. Now, at the time, America had been fighting the Cold War for quite some time, and the arms race with the Soviet Union had reached its peak. And so, the Pentagon wanted reactors that could do double duty, generate electricity, and produce weapons material both at the same time. Thorium couldn't do that, so America abandoned it, buried the research, and poured trillions of dollars into uranium infrastructure instead. For the next 50 years, thorium reactors were treated like a scientific curiosity, the sort of idea scientists thought interesting enough to flirt with and write edgy papers about in academic journals, but far too impractical to actually build. Western energy experts insisted that the technical challenges were insurmountable. The corrosive molten salts would eat through any reactor vessel within months. Neutron radiation would shatter structural materials, and the tritium byproduct posed unmanageable contamination risks. The costs were too high, the time frame too long, and the possibility of success too dicey. So thorium was binned. But while Western scientists were explaining why it couldn't be done, Chinese engineers were already rolling up their sleeves. In 2011, China's state council approved a $3 billion research initiative called the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor Program. Their goal? Build a working prototype by 2024. The international scientific community laughed. Energy analysts called it propaganda. Western media dismissed it as another example of China's tendency to overpromise and underdeliver on moonshot projects. But one thing these doubters had fundamentally misunderstood was the Chinese approach to engineering. Because in China, impossible isn't a wall, it's just an inconvenient speed bump. While American energy companies were lobbying Congress to protect their coal and uranium investments, China was pouring concrete in the Gobi Desert. And now, just 13 years later, their seemingly impossible dream has become reality. China's thorium reactor isn't just operational, it's damn near perfect. While producing clean energy with zero carbon emissions, the reactor generates a lot less radioactive waste than most traditional reactors. The best part? It operates at atmospheric pressure, meaning it physically cannot explode like Chernobyl or Fukushima. The United States had a 50-year head start on this technology and chose to abandon it. China picked up the blueprints, improved them, and built the future while America was still debating whether it was even possible. So how did they do it? What secrets lie hidden in that remote facility in the Gobi Desert? And what does this mean for the global balance of power as we hurtle toward a future where energy is everything? Why they left it. Now, before we go on, it's very important that we get one thing right. When America said thorium reactors were impossible, they weren't just being dramatic or trying to gatekeep some secret technology out of spite. Their fears were actually born out of genuine concerns. There were three real catastrophic engineering problems that had stumped the brightest minds in nuclear physics for over half a century. And somehow, China managed to surmount all of them. But before we dive into how they did it, 
you need to understand exactly what made thorium reactors such a nightmare to build, because once you grasp the scale of these challenges, China's achievement becomes even more jaw-dropping. The first problem was the issue of heat. Imagine trying to work with a liquid so corrosive, so violently reactive, that it eats through steel like acid through paper. Heating that sort of liquid to 700 degrees C would easily turn lead into vapor. That's the environment inside a thorium molten salt reactor. The problem is many traditional reactors use solid uranium pellets, but thorium reactors need a bubbling, churning mixture of thorium dissolved in molten fluoride salts. That way, the liquid fuel can flow continuously through the reactor core, absorbing neutrons, generating heat, and producing energy. To be fair, it does sound really elegant, except for one tiny problem. Molten fluoride salts are among the most corrosive substances known to science. At 700 degrees C, these salts won't just corrode metal, they'll annihilate it. That level of heat means they can penetrate microscopic grain boundaries in steel alloys, cause catastrophic embrittlement, and trigger a process called tellurium cracking that can shatter reactor walls from the inside out. In the 1960s, when Oak Ridge National Laboratory was running their experimental thorium reactor, they discovered that conventional stainless steel lasted about six months before the reactor vessel walls started to fail. Even the most advanced nickel-based superalloys of the era, Hastaloyan, Incanal, and Hannes alloys, could only survive for about four years before they needed to be replaced. Four years sounds like quite a while, but then you consider that a commercial nuclear power plant needs to operate continuously for at least 30 years for it to be economically viable. Replacing the entire reactor core every four years would cost hundreds of millions of dollars. That's just an act of financial suicide. American metallurgists tried everything. They experimented with dozens of alloy compositions, tested ceramic coatings, and explored exotic materials like molybdenum and tantalum. Nothing worked long term. By the 1980s, the consensus was clear. There is no material on Earth that can withstand 700 degrees Celsius molten fluoride salts for three decades without catastrophic failure. And the troubles didn't end here. If molten salt corrosion was the first circle of hell, neutron radiation damage was the second. Inside a nuclear reactor core, Billions of neutrons are constantly flying around at nearly the speed of light, smashing into everything in their path. When a neutron hits an atom in the reactor's structural material, it doesn't just bounce off. It embeds itself deep inside the atomic lattice, displacing other atoms and creating microscopic defects. Over time, these defects accumulate. The metal becomes brittle, cracks form. Before long, structural integrity collapses. This process is called neutron embrittlement, and it's one of the biggest reasons why traditional uranium reactors have a limited lifespan. After 40 years of neutron bombardment, even the toughest steel becomes as fragile as glass. But if you thought molten salt corrosion and neutron embrittlement were bad, there's a third nightmare, tritium. Tritium is a rare isotope of hydrogen, it's produced as a byproduct in thorium reactors when neutrons interact with lithium atoms in the molten salt coolant. And here's the problem. Tritium is incredibly difficult to contain. Many other radioactive elements are heavy and easy to shield, but not tritium. It's the lightest radioactive substance in existence. Chemically, it acts just like regular hydrogen, which means it can bond with oxygen to form radioactive water. And since tritium is so small and light, it can diffuse through solid metal walls, passing straight through steel like a ghost walking through a wall. This is called tritium permeation, and it's terrifying. If tritium were to escape from the reactor, the fallout would be terrible. Of course, the immediate sufferers would be the workers at the facility who'd be exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. Then, groundwater would quickly get contaminated, and that would poison ecosystems. Even trace amounts of tritium contamination can render an entire facility uninhabitable for decades. This isn't some theoretical possibility. Japan has been a victim of this when they attempted to build an experimental fusion reactor that produced tritium as a byproduct. Despite using triple-layered containment barriers and advanced ceramic coatings, tritium leakage exceeded safe limits within the first year of operation. The project was eventually abandoned after billions in losses. 
American nuclear engineers studied the Japanese failure extensively and concluded that tritium containment in a molten salt environment was an unsolvable problem. So essentially, if you were to build a working thorium molten salt reactor, you'd have to solve three nearly impossible problems at the same time. First, invent a material that can survive 700 degrees Celsius molten salt for decades, then stop neutron radiation from shattering that material, and finally, contain tritium, a radioactive gas that slips through solid metal without leaking. Oh, and you'd have to do all this while keeping costs competitive with coal, natural gas, and traditional uranium reactors. In that case, we can't really blame everyone else for chickening out. But somehow, China managed to solve all of these problems completely, definitively. The main advantage they had was with location. The site for the reactor near remote Wuwei City on the edge of the Gobi Desert was chosen for multiple reasons. The first was its total isolation. Here, they could work in complete singleness of mind. The region was also seismically stable, meaning that there had been no major earthquakes there on record. Also, the region had access to underground aquifers. And in the event that there was a catastrophic leak, the radioactive contamination would be contained in the desert. Oh, and this thorium molten salt reactor doesn't require any water at all. Most conventional nuclear power plants depend on large volumes of cooling water, and that makes them vulnerable to droughts and heat waves. The philosophy behind this billion dollar project was crystal clear. Pick the smartest people, give them unlimited resources, remove bureaucracy, and demand results. America had given up on thorium research in the 70s. Now, China was quietly translating every Oak Ridge report, studying every failure, and preparing to improve on it. Turns out, they did. To overcome the corrosion, researchers redesigned the alloy atom by atom, adding titanium, boosting molybdenum, introducing niobium, and refining purity to an extraordinary 99.97%. After three years of testing thousands of samples under electron microscopes and spectrometers, they'd finally created a super alloy that can survive molten salt for over 30 years. It reduced corrosion by 87% and virtually eliminated any cracking. For the reactor's graphite moderator, instead of using graphite blocks, engineers packed the core with 60,000 silicon carbide-coated graphite spheres, each of them about the size of a tennis ball. Molten salt flows between them, creating a naturally self-regulating neutron environment. When the temperature rises, the salt expands, reducing neutron absorption and slowing the reaction without any control rods. Next, a freeze plug failsafe would melt if overheated and drain the fuel into underground tanks. This design meant that a meltdown was physically impossible. Then, before loading real fuel, scientists used a powerful supercomputer to build a full digital twin of the entire reactor system. 